following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Our canon number 18, the twilight. This arcanum is very interesting. As you can see in the graphic, it is related with uh, with two dogs or two wolves. Behind these two dogs or wolves, we find two pyramids. The pyramid is a symbol of thought, a symbol of the mind. As you remember, uh, the Egyptians were the builders of the pyramids in Egypt, of course, but there were more uh, pyramids in different parts of the world. Among the Mayans and Aztecs, you find other pyramids, and the one that uh, built them were called the Toltecs which are, of course, uh, the meaning of Toltec means the builders, as the meaning of masons, which means builders. In itself, the mind, as you know, in Sanskrit, is manas. Manas means man. That's the, the word that uh, we always pronounce in English, man, comes from that uh, term, manas, mind. So here we see, of course, the meaning of, uh, of this arcanum, we will say, is to be or not to be. Because we find that it is related with the ninth seer twice. As you know, we were talking very often about the tree of life, that the ninth seer is Yesod, and that Yesod is always related with the sexual organs. When we uh, place Adam Kadmon, Behind the ten sephiroth. So Yesod means foundation. And of course, nine plus nine is eighteen. In order to comprehend this, we have to go into the different types of souls that are talked in Kabbalah, which are Nefesh, 
ruach, neshama, haya, and yehida. <coughs> Five aspects we will say that we might relate with the Divine Mother. Because indeed, the Divine Mother makes the universe. We will say the Divine Cosmic Mother makes the universe within her womb. But she takes the universe out from the Muladhara Chakra of the Elohim. And this is something very significant because, as you know, we were talking very broadly about the word Elohim. And we always state this, uh, that this word, Hebrew word, is a plural word, not a singular. Because in Hebrew, in Kabbalah, the feminine words that end in OT are feminine plural. And the words that end in IM are masculine plural. That's why the word Elohim is a feminine word with a masculine plural ending. So therefore, the translation or the word Elohim is not God, as many translators translated the Bible and said that in the beginning God created. The, the right translation should be, in the beginning the gods and goddesses created the heaven and the earth. Here we find, of course, that uh, that's why I said that the Divine Cosmic Mother, that in Kabbalah is named Aima Elohim, took the universe, or we will say the seed of the universe, from the Muladhara Chakra, or the Elohim. Gods, or as we call them in Gnosticism, Cosmocreators. Or oh, as we call them in Christianity, archangels. In order to understand this word archangel, we had to go into the arche or the archeos, which is precisely the whole uh, attributes of God in activity within that being that we call angel. A self-realized being, in other words, that uh, performed the great work in past cosmic days. What is the great work? The great work is also called the self-realization of the being. What is the self-realization of the being? It is the complete development of all the attributes, all the attributes of God within any creature. What is what the absolute wants? What is what the aim of wants? is to, com to, to, uh, to completely develop its own attributes in order to know itself. Madame Blavatsky, the great master writer of the, uh, the book uh, The Secret Doctrine, stated that the aim of itself is profoundly unknowable to himself. But it needs the universe, it needs creation in order to know itself.
Of course, there are many parts of that that we call the Ain Sof or the Ain, which is precisely the three aspects that we find above the tree of life. Immediately after Keter, we find the Ain Sof Or, which is that universe that exists within the unknowable universe. After that, we find the Ain Sof and beyond the Ain, which means nothing. In itself, each one of us has its own Ain Sof. I mean, yeah, there are many Ain Sofs in the universe, as many individual beings in the universe. Within the Ain Sof, exists all the possibilities of creation. It is stated that everything goes into the ends of at the end of the cosmic night. And everything returns from the ends of in the beginning of any cosmic day of any creation of any universe. But the ends of is that that we can call the multiple perfect unity. Because it is formed by many. You imagine the ocean. That's why, uh, for instance, in Kabbalah, it is symbolized with uh, mems of it, which is a symbol of water. But there are noble waters. Within every drop, within which every drop is a part of it. So imagine a vast, infinite ocean within which every drop is part of it. So everything is within the drop, and the drop is within everything. Every drop itself needs to know the ocean. And that's precisely the objective of creation. To know. But in order to know, has to develop those attributes. And those attributes cannot be developed within the water, but out of the water. And that's why the universe exists. In order for that drop to manifest its power and to withdraw again into the ocean already knowing its own capabilities. Within every drop, within every ain of, we find three particles. We will, we will say three atoms. When we say atoms, please do not think physical atoms. Because this word is a Greek word which means small. We say atoms in the sense that there are three particles of itself. But it is not matter. Neither energy. These three particles of the aims of have the power of creation. And every drop, every ain of or every star has those three particles. In Christianity, those three particles of the ain of are called Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In Hinduism, those three particles of the ain of are called Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. Among the Aztecs, these three particles are called Ometekutli, Quetzalcoatl, and Tlaloc. The Mayans call them Huracan, Tepeu, Gukumats. The tree of life show us these three particles are Keter, Chokmah, Bina. 
So these three particles of the Ein Sof have a power of creation, power to create. But they don't know how. Well, as you know, for instance, within your brain, you have many capabilities. You could be a doctor or an engineer. could be many things. But if you don't know how, you have to go to the university and develop that and to study it, and then you become a no. But every human being has those capabilities within if they are put in activity. So what the aims of? has the power of creation, because it's part of the inside. But it needs to know how to learn, how to do it. And that is why the Elohim of, path, of past cosmic days enter into action. As we will say, if you are a student, and if you want to learn a certain... Uh, uh, what do you call type of work or profession they need professors teachers that are already passed there and they are going to teach you how to do it and they will place little by little their lessons and their lectures on your mind and you have to study that and you have to practice it the same way is with the Elohim the new monads that are virgin and that have the capability of doing it need to learn from teachers that already did it. And those teachers are called archangels, cosmo creators. In many other religions they call it gods, divas. It doesn't matter how they're called. The truth is that they exist. And when these virginal sparks from the absolute abstract space emerge from it and appear in the universe, then those uh, cosmo creators engender them with a spark of light. That spark of light is what in Kabbalah is called Neshama, the soul. Is what in Sanskrit is called Atman. But that Neshama that the archangels give and put inside that Ein Sof has also another attribute which is called Ruach. That in Kabbalah is called the thinking soul. En Nefesh, which is called breath, or animal soul, which is that part of what we call the human soul. In synthesis, we will say that the archangels impregnate the Ains of with a monad. In order not to enter into confusion, we have to clarify this. The monad itself, itself, uh, the Ains of is a monad because monad mean, comes from the uh, from the Greek word monas, which means unity. So the Ains of itself is a monad. But the archangels impregnate that monad with another monad. Understand? Another unity. Within that unity, that monad that the archangels are putting within that ains of is how they are going to teach that ains of how to develop its own attributes. Because it is through experience they have to do it. That's why we say that the end of is our super monad, which is beyond our own particular monad, but in itself are one, because they integrate in one whole. 
So we hold here that in the universe or in any solar system, there is always seven archangels that are in charge of the seven mighty rays that organize creation. Every solar system has seven. I am not saying that only seven archangels exist in the solar system. There are many, millions. What I am saying is that the hierarchy, the higher rank are seven, which are in charge of the rest. Or the, any other archangel has to align to any of those seven in order to work in this creation. Many times we name these seven spirits behind the throne of God, Cosmo Creators, we repeat today. Gabriel, Raphael, Uriel, Michael, Samael, Zahariel, and Orifiel. Those are the seven mighty archangels which are head of the seven mighty rays. And all the monads, whether they are self-realized or not, had to align within those seven rays in order to organize creation, in order to help the virginal monads that came into the universe in order to learn. Now these virginal sparks of life have everything in potentiality, but not in activity. So they had to follow the will of the Elohim because they don't know. That's why as any seed that in order to develop needs to be put it into the soil. Likewise, every monad that needs to develop has to put it into the matter. Because the mother, the mother, Aima Elohim in his five aspects, is the one that will develop that within her womb. And different aspects. And that's why those particles, those monads, send nefesh, or we will say part of nefesh, of that human soul into the matter because through that elemental force the monad is going to learn so that fraction of soul is like is what in Buddhism is called buddhatta because the monad itself is called Buddha. You see? That Atman, that Neshama that we are talking here, that is within that Aesop is called Buddha in Buddhism. And the part of that is called Buddhata. That fraction of soul is the one that enters. And the monad we learn through it. And it starts from the very bottom of the matter. And then those virginal sparks, those elementals, start to evolve within the mechanicity of the will of Samsara. It will be a mechanical development. It cannot be an individual development. Impossible. Because those monads are ignorant. They need to learn first. So little by little, they will acquire that that many call individuality. But in order to acquire that, before that, they have to be 
into what is called uh, communal will. Will in group. will follow, of course, collective will power. That collective will power is always organized by the angels. They are monads that began their evolution in the mineral kingdom. And when you see with your clairvoyant eye any stone, any rock, any mineral element, you see those virginal sparks that are working in groups and that they are organized by the angels. The angels, of course, work into that that we call the, the world of formation. There are many millions of angels organizing the world of formation, those virginal sparks. Many clairvoyants and great initiates wrote many books in the past and talk about gnomes, pygmies, dwarves, leprechauns. People think that it's just the imagination or the fantasy of people of the past. They still exist. They are doing their work in spite of the skepticism of the blind that cannot see beyond their nose. Because in order to see those creatures, we need to activate the clairvoyant eye. And they work in groups, collectively. The will that they obey is the will of the angels. According to the will of the angels, they do this, they do that. And the angels, of course, obey another hierarchy. There's always hierarchies that they have to follow because everything is organized according to the law of karma. Because every planet exists because of karma, cause and effect. This planet Earth is the effect of previous manifestations of cosmic days. So the angels have to obey and act according to those Last, as well, the archangels. The monad is formed in itself mainly by what we call Ruach and Neshama. That's why when we say Ruach Elohim, we are pointing that monad that is performing the work according to its own level. Because each one of us has his own particular Ruach Elohim, but in his own level. And of course, that thinking Ruach, that knowledgeable Neshama, act under the direction of the angels and control the spark which is within the matter. That spark is the elemental that we call non, pygmy, or whatever name. That elemental obey his own father, his own monad. So there you find that nature gives unto those elementals protoplasmic bodies, a gift. So any creature or the mineral kingdom has a protoplasmic body. A body, body made of protoplasmic matter. Which is related to the fourth dimension. Molecular and atomic. Not cellular. Because the cellular bodies are what we call here rocks, stones, metals. And that we touch with our hands, physical hands. But those protoplasmic bodies cannot be touched by the hand. It could belong to another dimension. And through those is how the monad act. They are very ductible. 
Through evolution, they go into the plant kingdom. And when they acquire more knowledge within the Ruach and the Neshama of that particular monad, act and receive more knowledge about creation, about evolution. In the plant kingdom, you find beautiful families of elementals that work on the direction of the angels. And they create according to their own ray. Because, as I said in the beginning, every monad belongs to a particular ray among the seven. So every ray is related with certain vibrations, forces. Now you find that there are trees that give uh, different fruits according to his own kind, as it is written in the book of Genesis. According to his own kind, to his own force, to his own energy, to his own ray. Those elementals, of course, work in what we already talked in other lectures about the tatuas of nature. They move the forces of nature according to the will of the angels. According to the karma of the planet. They work in a collective will. They don't work independently. Unless somebody that knows how to control them can do it. Because of course, you know, a dog, a family of dogs, obey one particular entity or angel. And do what they had to do. But you can take a dog and teach that dog to be evil. To be bad dog. Or to be good. And then it's another influence. But then you are, of course, involving your karma with that particular creature which is innocent. Because those monads control their own souls according to the will of the angels. But if somebody comes and make a, how do you call a craft in a tree, that adulterate a tree with another tree, in order to make, they say, a better fruit, they are adulterating the plant. And therefore, they are breaking the law of nature. Therefore, they are gaining karma unconsciously. Because an adulterated plant doesn't give unto the fruit the energy that is needed for the development of other uh, entities, beings, that need to eat that. So, any fruit that is not adulterated is good. Because they contain not only food for your physical body, but for your inner monad as well. This is something that the scientists of this planet Earth ignore. The fruits of the Earth, plants, vegetables of the Earth, not only feed the physical body, but even the monad. Because that energy is susceptible in its constitution. But an adulterated plant doesn't give that. Because it's adulterated. The seed doesn't work that way. And that's why we call in Kabbalah the Tzalem. Tzalem. Or Tzalem. Which is the image. A solar force. Or the image of God. That image of God works in different ways. And of course... Salem, the image of God, is precisely those. Neshama, Ruach, and Nefesh, which are in each monad, that has to develop. Because it's the power of the Elohim. And the Elohim work under the direction of the world of Atziluth. And Atziluth work under the direction of the ends of Or. So the light. When these creatures are ready, the plant kingdom 
these elementals enter into the animal kingdom. Then in the animal kingdom, they start developing desire, or the body of desire, the evolution of the protoplasmatic bodies. That's how we will say the difference between the plant, minerals, and animals. The animals have desire, and they act in groups as well. That body of desire is called in Sanskrit Kamarupa, in which the animal act collectively. According to the will of Samsara and the law of evolution, that nefesh, which is bottled up, or that is working according with the forces of nature in the protoplasmic bodies and on the direction of the angels and archangels. Every monad receives an act and learns. But the goal of creation is to create human beings. Creatures that will have individuality, individual willpower, not collective, that will act with responsibility. You see, this word responsibility means the ability to respond to his own monad without any intervention. So therefore, the last gift that the Elohim give unto those monads that are evolving in the mechanicity of nature, because it's a me mechanic evolution, is the intellect. Those protoplasmic bodies, which are mind, through which the monad works, receive the intellect, reasoning, Or we will, stay, we will state, start to develop in reasoning. And to analyze things. And this is how they start to discover that they reach that level. Because they have no ego. Their, their own essence, together with the monad, knows very well that now, in order to go beyond the animal kingdom... They need to exercise, to exert willpower, and to control the inferior kingdoms, which are mechanical. And of course, here is precisely the problem. Because the will of samsara ends in the intellectual animal, the evolution. The intellectual animal means that nefesh, that anima, that soul, reach a level of intellect. You see, this is something that we have to learn because when we said animal comes from Latin, anima, which means soul. So that anima is in the mineral kingdom, plant kingdom, animal kingdom, and finally in the kingdom of the intellectual animal that have the opportunity to become individual, human being. Why? Because the intellectual animal body that resembles the human shape has three brains. No other creature in this nature has three brains. We have the intellectual brain, the emotional brain, and the instinctual motor sexual brain. Any animal of the kingdom has uh, two brains, but not the intellectual brain. We have them. We have that, that's why we said that we are three-centered, or three-brained creatures. But there's something very important that we have to understand here. The word nefesh haya, which translation is living soul. Of course, 
In nature you see um, beautiful living souls, nefesh hayas. In the book of Ezekiel, they are represented only by four. The lion, the eagle, the bull, and the human being. But of course there are other nefesh hayas there, but are synthesized because they are related with the internal bodies that we have to create and with the four elements that we have to control. An eagle is an efesh haya. An efesh haya means a creature that has the attributes of an eagle. You see, an eagle is beautiful. Fly high from the house to fish. How to eat as a beautiful intelligence. That's an Eves Haya, but it's still Haya in the sense that you said Haya, animal, because Hayot, or creature, I would say, that has those attributes. A lion is an Eves Haya with all those attributes in order to be a lion. A bull, in order to be a bull, has all the attributes of the bull. So he's an Efesh Haya. And the human being has to be an Efesh Haya too. But if we investigate all the people that exist in this world, we don't find any Efesh Haya there. Because you know, the human being, it is written. It's a being, that a soul, an Efesh that controls the elements of nature. That is a king of nature. And, uh, or queen, if you want. But the present uh, human being is a slave of nature. This is enough to remember the many earthquakes, the tsunamis, the hurricanes that kill all of those creatures that are called human beings wrongly. Because they are not. We have to become human beings. An Efesh Haya. And that Efesh Haya is related always with the Esod. In Kabbalah, when we name the human being, we always put it here in Yesod. A male. But it's different in relation with Yesod. And in order to be a human being, an Efesh Haya, a living soul, as the book of Genesis says, you had to climb Malkut, Yesod, Hot, Netzah, and Tiferet. In order to become into the image of the Elohim. I mean Elohim that controlled the forces, because the Elohim controlled the forces of creation. And the present intellectual animal or humanoid of this planet Earth it's not controlling in the, the forest of creation. It's a slave of sex. Because you saw this foundation, the sexual force. Slave of sex. As the animals, the beasts fornicate, also they fornicate. Fornication is called spasm, orgasm, which any beast performs. Any beast in the kingdom fornicates, means reach the spasm or the orgasm in the sexual act. But a human being is different. Human being is that which does not eat of the fruit of good and evil. Three. And that's precisely the, uh, the name here, because when you find, for instance, the word uh, tree in Kabbalah is ot. Which is means with Ayin and with Sadi. Two letters. A lot of wisdom of them. Otz Chaim. Chaim. Plurality of life. Chai. So then you find that uh, when you reach this level in which we are right now, which we are intellectuals, then we have the opportunity to become individuals, to perform a transformation. 
A transformation that is not the outcome of evolution, but of revolution. That's why it is called the revolution of the consciousness. Not the revolution that people perform in this physical world, killing others in the name of their religion. But that's just the mechanicity of that mind, which is protoplasmic, that is going to fall, because eventually the protoplasmic bodies, according to the will of samsara, once they reach the summit, they have to descend. That's the law. Or to fall, whatever you want to call it. Down. It's called devolution. And that's precisely the point of this arcanum. Those protoplasmic bodies that were serving creation, when they start descending or falling into devolution, they become the secret enemy. The secret enemy that is shown by the Arcanum 18. Because that secret enemy, or we will say that that we're using, the solar force that we're using in evolution, in a positive way, now the forces of nature, the moon, is going to turn those protoplasmic bodies to the server of devolution. It's just mechanicity. The problem is that Nefesh, the soul, is trapped within. And if the soul doesn't know how to go out, will sink into Klipoth into hell, into inferno, or whatever you want to call the infra dimensions, which are symbolized by the night infra spheres below Malkut. So those protoplasmic bodies will act in a devolving way. It doesn't matter what you believe, what you think. It doesn't matter if you like it or not. Those protoplasmic bodies are inside of each, everybody and are devolving because that's the law. It's like, for instance, when you are in a body of a child, whether you like it or no, that body will grow. Will reach the teenage age, adulthood, will be adult, whether you like it or not, because that's mechanicity. And when you reach certain age, that body will decay, will become old, whether you like it or not. So you have there many people that have old bodies, that scarcely they can walk, because they are old, they can do nothing. Scientists trying to find, of course, the way in order to prolong that misery. But at the end, everybody will die. Nobody can mock death. And that's the truth. So, of course, in the same way that the physical body evolves and devolves, in the same way that anything in this nature, plant, grows, evolves, and evolves, decays, turns into dry wood, the same way the protoplasmic bodies. The problem is that they uh, act in another big circle, which is not physical, but a circle of eternity, which has a beginning and the end. Because eternity in Gnosticism is not a never-ending time. No, it's a circle. Time is a circle, eternity is another circle. It has a beginning and the end. So therefore, the protoplasmic bodies, when we reach the level in which we are, which are inside, which is this mind that is thinking, which is this feeling that we are feeling, will devolve, will go down, because belong to nature. And the body that we have doesn't belong to you. Whether you like it or not, whether you burn the body, whether you go to the, to the grave, it will turn into dust, because it belongs to nature. And after that, it will grow maybe in a tree. Like why? This is, this is the law of the cosmic trogo auto egocrat. So therefore, the protoplasmic body had to be disintegrated in order to give consistency of rock to the planet. And that's why, in order to give that consistency of rock to the planet, 
they have to enter into the abyss, which is in the very center. Dante Alighieri described that, the abyss, inferno, hell, the inferior dimensions where those protoplasmic bodies turn into plants, minerals, and are disintegrated. That's the law. This is what the book of Revelation called the second death. That is what every religion is always concerned. To be saved. We need to be saved. And when we say we need to be saved, we are talking about here the soul, nefesh. Needs, needs to be saved. But for that, we need to make a revolution. If we think that we can go to heaven with the protoplasmatic bodies that we have, we are wrong. Because then this planet will become like sponge. All the matter go up into heaven. So this planet, uh, where is the consistency? Everything returns here. It's the law of return and reoccurrence. Evolution and devolution of matter. Remember that we are not talking here about nefesh here. It's the matter. The protoplasm bodies. The problem is that we are bottled up within it. We are trapped. Because when those bodies devolve, in turn into lust, animal defects that strengthen, anger, greed, vanity, laziness, gluttony, you name them. There are many. That's why this great uh, initiate, Victor Hugo, he said, if I have a thousand tongues to talk in a pallet of steel, I cannot enumerate my defects Certainly. Completely. Because we have many. Those problematic bodies become and transform into that that we call Medusa. That's why I said those who identify with Medusa turn into stone. Of course. They go down into hell, into the night sphere. Because in the night sphere every body is turned to stone. I mean those bodies. And we are trapping it. If we identify with it, we will turn into stone. And that Medusa is not outside, it's inside. Everybody has a Medusa within. That's why the great Kabir Jesus of Nazareth, he said, it is necessary to be born again in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven. To be born again doesn't mean to believe in him. As many people think. Believe that Jesus died for you and you are saved. Well, you can believe that. But a woman doesn't got pregnant because he's believing in that. He needs a sexual act. He needs energy. So in order to be born again, we need sexual energy. But the process is different. We have to stop eating of the fruit of the tree of good and evil, which is sexuality. To stop eating of it means to transmute the Zalem, the image of God, which is within the sexual force. Because God is creative energy. So if we transmute, if we sublimate that force in the sex, and then the eventual creation of the internal bodies comes. And this is how Ruach and Neshama, or that Ruach Elohim, start creating a creature according to his own image. Different. No an animal. Because to be a bull, to be a, a, a lion, or to be a tiger, and a fish guy of that type, is wonderful, of course, because those creatures are beautiful. But that are the outcome of evolution. The human being is not the outcome of evolution. We have to exercise willpower. Our motto is telema. And the fight is against the occult enemy, which is inside. But that occult enemy, which is the ego, which is the protoplasmic bodies, that are turned now against us, because it's just following the mechanicity of nature. When you say they turned against us, means against us, our souls. 
Because we want to go up to our Father who is in heaven. But the mechanicity of nature said, no, I have to go down, I'm sorry. If you don't do anything here, I won't take you further. Because this is the will of Samsara. And that's why great avatars, great messengers came in order to teach this humanity. Moses came and taught the doctrine. Abraham came and taught the doctrine. Krishna, Jesus, Buddha, and all of them, according to the place where they were growing and teaching, the same doctrine. It's nothing new. Now, of course, it's more open and more clear because we are mature. We have exercise and the intellect is very developed. So we understand. But please understand that it's not a matter of believing in something or belonging to something group. There are people that think that because I belong to this group, I go to heaven. Or because I believe to this race, I will go to heaven. Or because I am following this uh, guru, I will go to heaven. It has nothing to do with it. It's a practical work. Instead of the protoplasmic bodies, which are mechanical and they belong to any creature in nature, we have to create our own individual bodies. We have to create an astral body, a mental body, and a body of willpower. Three bodies inside. That will give us that individuality. Then, we can talk about becoming a human being. And that's precisely the level of Haya, the other soul that is talking Kabbalah. Haya. In order to become a Nefesh Haya, that Nefesh has to grow to Haya. With the help of Ruach and Neshama, of course, his own monad. Through initiation. So we have to transmute the sexual force. Because this is the only force that creates. We have to follow the rules. That give us the keys in order to control those evil entities that we have within. There are certain creatures that when they reach this level... They think that the matter of becoming a human being is to control the elements. That's it. Without being born inside. Without creating the solar bodies. Without creating that Merkaba. Or that chariot. That took Enoch or Elias into heaven. You see it's written that Enoch was taken to heaven because he was good. He was, of course, walking with God. You want to work with God? Then you will take him to heaven too. But to work with God doesn't mean to believe in God because there are millions of people that believe in God and are not working with God. To work with God means to understand, as Moses says, to love your inner God with all your mind, with all your heart, with all your strength. Three bodies, or the three brains, Sexual strength, emotional brain, and intellectual brain. You have to use all those energies to save them in order to create inside of you the psychological human being. And that is the big problem. To be or not to be. Many followers of many religions, or we will say of most religions, identify and they think yeah, that's by awakening their consciousness within the protoplasmic bodies, they are done. When somebody awakes the, proto, uh, the consciousness within the protoplasmic bodies, they go to hell. Simple example. Yogananda, Mahatma Gandhi, which between parentheses Mahatma means great soul. And Yogananda, a great soul too. Both of them are in hell. You will say, what? Yeah. If you go to limbo, which is the first sphere of hell, after the world of Malkut, you find all of those creatures that the Christianity call innocent children. 
which are there because they didn't receive the waters of baptism. It's called limbo. The fierce fear of hell. What are those waters of baptism? Are the sexual waters. They were not practicing chastity. They didn't transmute the sexual force in the holy matrimony. Therefore, they walk, but they are in hell. Because nobody can enter into the kingdom of heaven if he is not being born again. You cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven with rags of a beggar. You need to be a king, a malakim, and a malakim has his bodies. So therefore, when Dante Alighieri went into limbo, the first fear, you read the Divine Comedy, you will find he found there Socrates. He found Plato, many great philosophers. And likewise, when you go and investigate limbo, you find many Gnostics, many Jews, many Christians, many Muslims. And the funny thing is this, maybe it's not funny, but it's really sad. Each one of them in limbo approach you and show you the Bible. Or show you the Quran, the Torah, or show you the Buddhism and says, you come, you need to, to, to follow because you need to be saved. You need to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Meanwhile, they don't know that they are already in hell, in limbo. Because they don't have internal bodies. That's why Gnosticism insists to teach to humanity their chastity. But not that chastity that erroneously, many religions practice, which is sexual abstinence. No, it's not sexual abstinence. It's to know how to manipulate the sexual energy by following the rules of the sexual alchemy, which are synthesized in the Ten Commandments given by Moses. Those Ten Commandments are given to those that want to follow the path, not by believing in them, or to write them there and put it there in a park, or to repeat them by memory, or by mistakenly confusing the commandments, because many people mistake the first commandment, and they think that it's twice, it's two commandments in one. They say that the first commandment is to love your God with all your heart, etc., and the second commandment is not to make any image. Both are one. But how do they know that? They can repeat and make uh, many other commandments, really. They don't know because in order to understand, you know, to know Kabbalah, alchemy. In order to understand the rules. If you know the tree of life, you know where to place every commandment. And then you understand that Keter is the abstract. It's the abstract entity of God. You cannot make any image. But to put here in Chokmah that Second commandment, as a second commandment, is wrong. But people don't know. It doesn't matter anyhow. Because in order to follow, you have to accomplish the commandments. Which are ten. In order to be born. Once you are being born, then you are, you have to fight against your enemies. Those enemies are within you. Those enemies are those people. That's why when you find the process of Jesus of Nazareth, you find that the enemies of his work, of his mission, are the same people that are in religion at that epoch. The enemies of Krishna were the same race. Why? Because those protoplasmic matters that are within you are also within your brother, within your sister, within your father, within your mother, within your family, with all your race, everywhere. And they are related to attachments through traditions. The law of nature identify and like to, to people to identify with traditions, with things related with evolution and devolution. There are people that are so identified with the race, with their religion, that they really they think that by really interpreting, if they kill this unloyal, they go to heaven. This is Clipotic way of thinking. The unloyal 
the unfaithful ones, the uncircumcised that we have to kill, are inside of us. Those animal entities that we call lust, anger, greed, hatred, gluttony, laziness. That's what we have to annihilate. By annihilating them, then we are making a great transformation within us. We are being born again. And then we are creating that kerubi, or that kerub of Ezekiel. The lion, which symbolizes the astral body, the inner Christ. The eagle, which symbolizes the mental body. The bull, that symbolizes the physical body. And then you find the man, which symbolizes Tifereth, controlling Yasad. Because remember that Tifereth emerges, all that emerges from Yasad, the waters of Genesis is Yasad. Moses was born from those waters. And that's why John the Baptist was baptizing in the waters. And that's why Jesus came from the waters. Because nobody can go up and perform all the miracles that perform without coming from the waters first. But those waters are the symbol of the sexual force. That we had to be in chastity. But we, if we behave like beasts in the sexual act, there's nothing being born there. We are just fortifying the ego. Of course, to create the internal bodies is one step. The second step is to deny. You have to deny yourself. It's what Christ says. You want to follow me? Deny yourself. To deny yourself means to deny all of those Entities that you have within. To deny all the ani- animal attributes that everybody has within. Because the human has to be born. And that's why, if you read the book of Genesis, you will find that the first, the second, the third, the fourth, and the fifth days were good. But the sixth is the only one that was very good. Because it is when the man is created. So anything is good. But to become a, a human being is very good. And if you have lust within, you are not very good. If you have anger within, you are not very good. If you have hatred, you are not very good. A human being has to be clean. Be perfect. As your father, your monad, who is in heaven, is perfect. With no animal elements within you. And we emphasize in the animal because that's the last step of evolution. Of course, we have to go beyond, but in the plant kingdom, those uh, elements are not so negative like in the animal kingdom. Because the animal, the animal desire is really strong and become very strong in the level in which we are. So there you find that those that enter into the world of Haya, a living entity, or a living soul, have to perfect themselves through higher works that I describe in Kabbalah. That's why we need to study Gnosis in order to know how to perfect ourselves. It's not like believing in something that in one week, in one month, or one year, we are going to be perfect. No. It's a process. With patience, you will possess your soul. It is written. If you are anxious, if you are greedy, covetous, coveting powers, nobody goes to heaven by coveting powers. The powers are developed within you when you annihilate your ego, when you annihilate your animal entities, naturally developed. That's why the Lord Jesus says, with patience you will possess your souls. What soul? Well, nefesh, which is bottled up in lust, which is bottled up in anger, which is bottled up in hatred, self-esteem, and all those defects that now people worship. Because in TV and radio you see that people, instead of fighting against those, they're worshipping those things. Animal elements that will take them to clip off. And that are taking people into clip off. 
You have to love yourself, but your inner being, not your protoplasmic bodies, don't have to be disintegrated. And by doing the work of denying yourself, which is a process within the 49 levels of the mind, the first level is the intellect. It's a process of meditation. That's why Buddha, Gautama Sakyamuni, came here in order to teach meditation. Because we need to meditate. We need to comprehend ourselves in order to clean the mind. And to possess our souls. To unify all of those children of Israel. As Moses wrote in his book Exodus. Because all of those children of Israel are precisely the Nefesh. That came into the world. Into Mazarim. In order to evolve. And they reached the level with the pyramids there in Egypt. Where... And they need to be saved. But Moses comes. Which is the will of God. In order to control the mechanicity. In order for the children of Israel to come out of the matter. And enter into the promised land. But that's a process in which you will see. You will touch. Because what we're seeing here is not something that we read. We experienced that. When we say that the plants have soul, it's because we saw the souls. We were. We have many experiences. When you develop and you enter in the initiation, you start developing your senses. And then you see that all creatures have soul. Not only we, as erroneously some religions teach. All nature is filled with soul. And that's why when we start thinking, or thinking in the beginning, but if we awake our senses and we see, then we will love everybody. And we see that all of us are in this universe and going to develop. Of course, in order to become an Efeshaya, a human being to the image of God, we have to resurrect. Resurrection is necessary. So when we enter into resurrection, but nobody resurrects in previously does not die. And if we are alive with Medusa, very alive within, if Herod the king is inside of us very strongly committing adultery and mocking religion, if inside of us is Judas very alive, not Judas the master, but Judas the ego that we have within, the traitor. Because Judas the master is a master that taught us that. That we have to kill ourselves. And if Caiaphas and Pilate is inside of us, no, we cannot resurrect. They have to be annihilated. And the only one that can annihilate those entities within us is God. We don't have to worry about the Caiaphas of the neighbor, of the pilot of the neighbor. Let them deal with their own demons and devils. They want to go to hell with that, they worship that, go ahead. But you have to care about yourselves. You have to stop looking at the spike in the eye of the neighbor. You have to see the trunk that we have within. That's the first rule. But unfortunately, we always like to see the spike in the eye of the neighbor. And we forget that the one that has to be purified is ourselves. If the neighbor wants to purify, let them do it. It's their problem. We have to respect. Because God respects, you see, free will. Give you the commandments. You want to follow? Okay. You don't want to follow? Okay, too. If God respects our own free will, why? who are we in order to exercise or to try to put in something in the mind of others? We, we, we have to respect we have to teach. Like all the avatars, all the messengers that came, teach and respect. You want to follow? Okay. You don't want to follow? Good too. So if you go on to resurrection, then you can talk about Yehida. 
Yehida is the highest. Related with this triangle. Ketecho Mabina. That soul, Yehida, is called in Buddhism. Or divided, we will say, in three aspects. The Dharmakaya, the Sambhogakaya, and the Nirmanakaya. These three kayas. Of course, the Adikaya. Related with the ends of or. Because Adi is light. So those levels of Yehida are only for resurrected masters. We do not deny that in meditation, by an ecstasy, by a samadhi, you can experience that. There are people that are really very serious in meditation, that practice yad, and they experience those levels. But to experience those levels and to be there as a citizen is different. To develop that, only a resurrected master. Yehida is, of course, related with the three glorious bodies in which the monad that started as a, as a beginner now is reaching that level and knows about cosmo creation. You see, everything is in steps. Learn and how to self-realize and enter into those levels of Yehida. When somebody reaches the ends of all with the development of Yehida as a resurrected master. Because first you have to resurrect. Nobody can develop that without resurrection. Then you enter into, into the realm of those beings that we talk in the beginning, archangels or angels. And then the Lord, Christ, the ends of or which is not a person, neither an individual, but an energy, a force, omniscient, omnipotent, take you into his own realm and throw you every cosmic day in order to repeat, in order to help him to do the same thing that the other archangel did with you, now you have to do with others, to help him from the very beginning. And that's precisely the development of knowledge. As I said in the other lecture, this is how the cosmo creators travel within cosmic days, helping Christ. Not by believing. And as Yehida, they enter within the very bosom of the Father. The unknowable, divine, which is here, the Ain. And they transform themselves into Paramartha Satyas. That's the goal. To become a Paramartha Satya. But it's not forcible. Nobody is forcing you or turning your arm and said, go and do it. No, if you, this will. This is individual. There is one being that did it and came back in order to teach. His name is Aberamento, the Master Jesus of Nazareth. There are many archangels that are trying to enter into the Ain and don't need to become Paramartha Satya. There are many of them. But the only one that we know that did it and came back in order to help and to teach how to do it is the Master Jesus of Nazareth. Master Abramento. The great rabbi of Galilee. But who understands this Master? Very few. Because this uh, humanity misunderstood his message. He taught with his life the way to do it. But everybody thinks that he did it. And if you are committed any sin, you believe in him, you are ready with your visa to heaven. And that is a big problem. And this is how people fall into that mistake. Not only in Christianity, in other religions too. 
they have the different beliefs. But of course, Gnosis, there has to be another belief. If you take Gnosis and make another belief of it, you will be ready for Klipoth as well. Because what we need is practical. Do you have questions? Well, they may, uh, uh, the question is, what type of karma does Mahatma Gandhi have going to be in purgatory? Well, he might have some type of karma, I don't know what. But he is not in purgatory, I mean, not purgatory, limbo. He is not in limbo because of certain type of karma. He is in limbo because he has not the internal bodies. Well, I mean, like, what about his future? As far as oh, well, those type of beings, like Mahatma Gandhi, like Yogananda and others that really did something good, they come back and the law gives them another body in order to work. And they really are treated very well. Because they are not being born in a, in a, in a common and ordinary home. They're going to be born in a house where the father and the mother knows about this that we are talking here. And they will be taught from the beginning. And they will raise like that. But they want that. All right? Fortunately, we have karma and we are being born in families where teaches only religion sometimes in a very rude way, in a very wrong way. Your question? So, when Adam and Eve was created by God, when they ate of the tree of life, they became animals. Is that right? Adam and Eve were animals. Animal, animal, as I said, means anima, soul in Latin. So Adam and Eve are souls, are animals. Like any animal is an anima. Any plant is an anima. Any mineral is an anima. The difference is that Adam and Eve symbolize the anima in the level of intellectuality, in which the Elohim tells them, if you know how to transmute the sexual energy of Yasad, the tree of good and evil, you will become like Elohim. And then they try. I said, okay, let's try. But because they don't know, they fornicate it, like the beasts. So instead of going up, they go down. You understand that? It's simple. Right. Now that we know a lot, because we don't need to teach here how to fornicate. Everybody knows about that. But we need to teach how to transmute. In order for that, rise your solemn, your, sal- your image, which is in your sex, and you will be create an Elohim within you. This is what the serpent said. But a serpent, Lucifer, is a tempter. Here's the temptation. It's fire. Triumph over, over temptation is light. But unfortunately, that humanity of the past didn't defeat temptation. Still, we are defeated by temptation. Because Lucifer is always there. Lucifer is the sexual potency. Without Lucifer, cannot be a sexual act. That's why there. Every time that a couple is performing the sexual act, Lucifer is in the middle. Without Lucifer, cannot be a sexual act. So the temptation is there. If you transmute your sexual energy, good, you defeat the temptation. But who is doing that? Most of humanity is defeated by Lucifer. They have to learn that energy. They have to learn. That's why it is, I said, that's why the great messengers came to teach this. All the great messengers and different religions teach the same thing. The same rules, different ways, of course, but it's the same. But if you fail in the first ordeal, which is sexual ordeal, you are done. You, you cannot pass. That's why the Kerube that is in front of the doors of Eden is with a flaming sword. That flaming sword is the blood, because the blood is the container of the fire. And it's circulating like that. You are in the sexual act, the sword starts going like this. And then the Kerubi says, Ah, oh, you reach your spasm orgasm, get out from Eden. Because Eden is voluptuousness. 
Eden is the happiness of God without bestiality. You have a question there? Since the monad came from a cosmo creator and is below Bina in the tree of life, could you say that it was the Bina of the cosmo creator that unfolded into masculine and feminine in order to create it? Obviously, the Elohim divide in that thanks to Bina. That's why the name of God in Atzilut is Yod Hava Elohim. In Yod Hava means Ava and Aima. Yod is the father, Hava is the mother. Yod Hava, Jahava, Elohim, is here in that. This is where precisely the monads are impregnated in that knowledge. Do other solar systems have other types of seven spirits before the throne of God, organizing other types of mighty rays? Please elaborate upon that. Yes. As I said, every solar system. Of course, we don't name the other solar system because scarcely we know this one. If we name another one, you don't know. It's like an experience that a certain student had with extraterrestrials. The student said to the extraterrestrial, I know that you are from other planets. Tell me from which planet. The extraterrestrial look at, uh, at the student like, well, no. Because if I tell you, how do you know? Nobody knows more than just the moon there in some certain planets of this. How do you know which planet? If I said, uh, for this planet of this solar system, how do you know? So he didn't answer. Right? So, of course, the uh, cosmo creators of other solar systems exist. But uh, uh, it's irrelevant to name them. You want to know them, you have to awake. Yeah? What is the first ordeal? The sexual ordeal? The first ordeal. Well, the first ordeal that the initial has to pass is the ordeal of the threshold. The guardian of the threshold. Which represents all of your illness. If you defeat that, you go ahead. Of course, the root of that guardian of the threshold is lust. If you are defeated in lust, you are defeated in everything. If you trump over lust, you trump o- over everything. And when I said lust, the main dish for dust is called orgasm, spasm, which the Bible calls fornication. What are the questions? Because the circle of, uh, the question is, what is the beginning and the end of eternity? Or he doesn't understand why eternity is a circle. We enter into this circle of time, in which we are right now. uh, And we came through the womb of our mother, with our physical body, into a new born body. And the circle of time will finish eventually when we die physically. When we die physically, then we return. We go into the circle of eternity. The circle of eternity takes us. It's another dimension. But eventually, when that circle ends again, we come back again into time. Well, as I said, what people call eternity is wrongly. Think that it's a never-ending time. No, eternity is a circle that has a beginning and the end. When you uh, say you've used all your, someone goes to heaven for a certain amount of time, uh, from an earthly point of view, but a certain point is good karma burned, uh, is burnt out, then he has to come back again. Well, in order to go beyond, uh, the thing is that in order to defeat eternity, you have to go beyond eternity. The circle of eternity is just beyond time, but beyond time and eternity is the other dimension, which is not possible to describe. It's where we find the Elohim, precisely, the creatures of heaven. It's beyond eternity. People think that eternity is, uh, is just there, heaven. No. It's part we will say, of the heavens. Right? But uh, eternity precisely uh, belongs to uh, 
Klipoth belongs to the circle of eternity. That's why many religions state that hell is eternal. Yeah, it's eternal. It's there. But it doesn't mean that you are going to be there eternal. For, I mean, long period of time. No. The souls were there in Klipoth, the sense, and eventually are disintegrated. I mean, the, the protoplasmic bodies. When the soul is free, emerges again out of hell. But hell be, remains there because it's eternal. But the punishment, I said, I explained, is not eternal. It has a beginning and an end. Otherwise, that will be really an unjust. Imagine the soul falling there because ignoring all of this, it will be eternally there. As we say, eternally, that will be really unjust. No, it has, a, it has an end. And the end is when all of those animal entities that we have are disintegrated mechanically. Then you are free. Delinquent is dead, you can go out. But if delinquent is alive, he's still there. What is the other question? Why are so many Gnostics paranoid about witches and sorcerers? What is the real danger there? Which, I mean, which Gnostics? I don't understand. Uh, which Gnostics are he talking about? Because I don't know. About witches and sorcerers, there are a lot. I know that witches and sorcerers exist everywhere, right? And they are, of course, souls that are slave of uh, clipothic forces. That they think that because they are awakening, they are going, uh, they are doing well, they are doing good, right? They know that they are going to be disintegrated sooner or later because they don't have internal bodies, solar bodies. And everybody in this world is a witch or a sorcerer in different levels. If you are doing something bad against somebody, you are a sorcerer or a witch. And if you know how to do it uh, with magic, you are worse. You are getting more karma. But that's your problem. That you will pay for that. But here, we are teaching white tantra, white magic. Yeah? Is it necessary to stop nocturnal pollutions before being able to defeat the guardian of the threshold? Well, let me tell you that you can defeat the guardian of the threshold in having nocturnal pollutions. Because one thing is to defeat the guardian of the threshold, which is a symbol of your defects and vices, and another thing is to tame the donkey, which means your physical body. The donkey which is the physical body that we use. This is how, remember that Jesus of Nazareth entered riding the donkey into Jerusalem. But unfortunately, the donkey is riding us. Because the donkey is that animal aspect that we inherit. Not only from the animal past, from our parents, because they engender us in fornication. Our grandparents, because they engender our parents in fornication. Grand-grandparents, because they engender whatever, you know. Everybody fornicates. So we have that in our blood. And to teach the donkey, hey, don't, don't fornicate. Teach the donkey, that, that's, we have to be patient. So sometimes, lust is there. Your lust won't be chased. Believe me. Lust wants to fornicate. And of course, in the beginning, the Gnostics have different problems in the internal planes where their lust is fornicating, committing adultery, committing, doing atrocities. They're returning to the physical body and say, my God, but I want to follow you. Yeah, but be patient because the animal doesn't want to follow God. And you have to teach. To control the donkey is the most difficult part. That's why it says, to transform that donkey into a man is not easy. Yes? Well, uh, uh, every apostle in the gospel of uh, the Christianity specifically is related with a certain type of power of the inner monad that we have to develop. Remember that uh, Moses, for instance, talked about the 12 tribes. But in this case, Jesus talked about the 12 apostles. 
we have in the New Jerusalem, he says that there is one angel there and has 12 doors when there is always an apostle or an angel in every door. That means that the New Jerusalem, the new city, the new heavenly city that we have to develop within in the psyche, have to develop certain powers, 12 powers, which are the main, because there are many, but these 12 powers are related with the uh, meaning of every apostle. So every apostle in the Bible represents that. And their life was related with it. What you read about the apostle, this apostle, that, is related with that development. Of course, they, they, individually speaking, they had to develop their own particular 12 apostles too. Because everybody, each apostle in himself, has his own particular inner Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has to be born inside and to develop. The 12 apostles too. The Buddha has to develop too. John the Baptist has to be born inside of us. Moses has to be born inside of us too. This is a development. Every simple eon or personage in the Bible represents part of the monad that we have to develop in order to become an Elohim. Of course, every monad has his own mission, his own powers. But they always develop that according to their fully development. This is how the universe is organized. Another question? The question is, what is the difference between the initiation of the being and the work that we do here, physically, our souls? Well, religare, that's a Latin word, which means religion, which means to unite. In the beginning, as we started this lecture, we explained that the monad, which is neshama and ruach, is learning and receiving all of that through nefesh, which is that elemental, that force that evolves. We are that. So anything that we do here, the monad absorbs it. Everything good. It learns it. Any initiation, any power that we acquire when we enter into the path is absorbed by God, by the monad. And in order for us to enjoy that, we have to deny ourselves. Because the monad, which is absorbing all those powers and initiations, won't release those powers into the, into nefesh, which is bottled up into the medusa. There will be a devil with powers. Imagine how the devil is right now. Referring to the devil that is inside of each one of us. You see this society, how it is? It's chaos. Chaotic. We are destroying each other. We are killing each other. For different reasons. Imagine the devil with powers. Oof. I don't want to even think about it. So therefore, if the soul that is entering into this path wants to enjoy those powers, God demands annihilation to follow his commandments. But if you are, of course, being born and doing the work, but still your ego is alive, your anger is alive, your hatred is alive, God doesn't give you anything. That's why it's three factors. To be born, to deny yourself, which means to annihilate the ego. Then God will give you when you see that it's innocence there. It's like when you see a, a boy, which is very mis mischievous, you know, take this uh, gun and, and go and shoot outside in the street. Learn how to shoot. It will be stupid, right? But you deliver the powers because the, God, the powers of God are can be used for destruction. Yeah. Also, our work, I would think, would be, you know, up and down, you know? Sometimes God, yeah, sometimes your inner monad gives you an experience, a beautiful experience. All the people are rapture, and would you enjoy certain things? And you say, oh, this God exists. And God said, yeah, here is this experience for you. 
Go back now and continue your work. Yeah? Yeah, the powers, the, the entity, of course. There's, we would say, uh, but let me explain this, you know. The apostles, every apostle, if you read, uh, there's always a lecture there already done in, 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 the, in the website, related with this. Okay. So every apostle has his own powers, related with certain glands. Sometimes, when people reunite, because that is also, that's, that's a, phenomen, a phenomenon which is shown in many groups, not only in Christianity, other groups. When they concentrate and ask for something specific, and every mind with a lot of faith, with a lot of concentration or belief, whatever you want to call it, then it's called a force of concentration. And then the energy of God comes and performs the miracle. Right? And that, that's, that's normal. Even, for instance, among many religions, it happens this. Among Catholicism, in among other religions in the in Asian in Asia, in Asia that they uh, worship statues. You see, the Elohim or those areas place on those statues certain elementals that control forces. So when the believer goes and asks with all their heart that, and then according to karma, the elemental goes and gives or takes whatever. It depends. And that's why this is something, many things that you, don't, you ignore about because the Elohim are merciful. Right? It doesn't mean because you are not walking on the path that you don't receive help. They help. But according to the law, always. Any other question there? Okay. Thank you very much. And have a nice weekend. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah, Lord,